uh, Astro family. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited about this. Um, really, like, we're going to do a very quick overview, very quick history of astrology. And this really is sort of my passion. I love looking at the philosophy and history and the development of astrology. Nothing is ever created in a vacuum. Okay, nothing comes out of nowhere. And so this shows you how um, astrology, being a living practice, had to evolve in order to serve the culture in which it found itself. Whenever I can, I will say things like, in my humble opinion, or I'm about to say something controversial, when those moments should come up, um, just to give you guys a warning, everything else that you see here that isn't a matter of my opinion or it is uh, from an academic paper that I wrote um, called, by the same name, Astrology's Connection to Archetypal Psychology. It's available on my website. My website address is in the gift bags that, you guys, uh, that I gave you guys. And if you go there under articles, academic papers, you'll find it. And it is referenced as well. So all the sources are in there as well. So when I entered the academic environment, I remember one of the first things they told us was the academy has specific rituals that deserve to be honored. And one of them is honor the academic ancestors. And so what that means is you've got to cite your work. Don't claim work that isn't your own. But I've come to realize that that also plays a part in astrology as well, right? So wherever I can, I do try to cite the sources of my inspirations and my ideas because, as I said, um, we love to think that someone was inspired and something came to them and it was so revolutionary. But the truth is nothing exists in a vacuum. Everything has a root, has an influence. All right, so this is just stuff about me and it's, in the little bags that give you all. Okay, so what you'll learn in this lesson, a very quick history. As on the previous slide, I mentioned that um, this was originally part of a three-hour talk that I gave at Astrology Toronto, and I only got through 80% of it. <laughs> and so I'm going to really try and keep the pace and go fast. Okay, so we're going way back, the history. We're going to talk about Ptolemy and then the and Arab astrology, the phenomenon of Arab astrology, and then the Renaissance, the discovery of Uranus, the discovery of Neptune, and then um, the move into psychology and how that happened. We're also going to touch on Alan Leo as well. So astrology, the oldest documents that we have in human history um, include documentation of what's happening in the cosmos and connecting it to events here on Earth. And as far as we can tell, Western astrology, so this is all Western astrology, it originates in um, ancient uh, Chaldea, uh, which is also known as, or generally speaking, can also be considered ancient Sumer, um, Mesopotamia. And then that knowledge was passed along or shared with the Egyptians who passed it along to the Greeks, who passed it along to the Arabs, and then to uh, Europe in the Renaissance, and then eventually um, towards psychological astrology. This gives you a lot more details, but as you can see, like with, um, with Indian influences, because Indian astrology, Vedic astrology, really is a different system. And with those Indian influences, they sort of come in waves, right? So um, just like imagine in the 60s. So in the 60s, there was this big wave. Everyone wanted to go to India and come back inspired. And so we saw at that time more Vedic influences in Western astrology as well. Ptolemy. Ptolemy. So this is one of our great um, ancestors. The entire tradition of Western astrology can find its foundation in the book Tetrabiblos, written by Ptolemy. Now, it's really interesting uh, in this book because he's also, he was also an astronomer, right? It, it was not unusual. In fact, it was, it was usual uh, for people who were studying the sciences to study the physical as a symbol for what was happening on spiritual levels and vice versa. So if you're looking at celestial phenomenon, you're not just looking at that, but it must mean something. And because it means something, you had to be both an astronomer and an astrologer. 
So what's interesting about Petra Biblos is that in this book, he, he says, well, first of all, has anyone read that book? Anyone? Excellent. So it's free online. Okay, Petra Biblos. When you read this text, as I said, it's free online because it's really old. It's about 1,800 years old. What's really interesting about it is that, okay, later chapters, like the second, the second a little bit, but really the third and the fourth, it's almost, it is like a cookbook, right? It's very precise, very, um, if your Mars is within three degrees of this, within the midheaven, and your sun is in this house, then at seven years old, the native will suffer a burn on the hand. Like it's that specific. There are very specific formulas. And uh, he used conception a lot. He was interested in that. He was calculating death, right, time of death, because he believed that that was stated. But what was interesting is in his early chapters, he talks about how as much as the stars have a, an influence, that's how he understood it, an influence, as much as they have an influence on us, our culture, our family, our environment also has an influence on us. So right there, he is setting the foundation, he's setting the stage for an astrology that isn't completely fatalistic, that isn't just about, okay, boom, everything is written up there. But he's acknowledging that we have some force. And you have to remember with any system of astrology and wherever astrology finds itself in, it is a perfect reflection of how we understand ourselves as human beings and how we understand our own agency, our power to be a force in our own lives. And so for Ptolemy, he lived in a time when um, really, 1,800 years ago in Greece, he was Syrian, writing in Greek. Um, if you think about it, really there was just a very select group of land-owning men who really had real agency over their lives. Everyone else, the moment you were born, your life was decided for you, your fate was decided for you. So it reflects, the astrology of the time reflects that belief of ourselves as human beings. In Centiloque, he wrote, the on, only those who are inspired by the deity can predict particulars. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about um, speculative versus realized readings. Um, I was talking about it before the mic started, so I'll say Jeffrey Cornelius, one of my dear professors, um, really coined and elaborated this idea of speculative versus realized readings. I have an article on my website about that, so please uh, have a look if you want more information. But basically what he said was that you can, like, you can learn the techniques, you can learn the different formulas, and you can say, okay, this person has Venus square Pluto. So, you know, sometimes you might feel uh, betrayal or you might feel uh, manipulated or you might be the manipulator. So you're going like that, you're listing what it is that Venus square Pluto could mean and adding elements of the sign and the houses. But when you are inspired and when you reach the point of a realized reading, it's almost like you are out of the way and your unconscious takes over and you're able to look at that symbol and say, boom, okay, you don't trust men and you haven't been in a relationship for a really long time. Or boom, wow, you're in an abusive relationship right now. Like you're able to do that. There's still a lot of value in the speculative stuff because that's how we gain the vocabulary so that when we are in the moment of a reading and we get out of the way and we let it be a realized reading, we have the vocabulary that's going to speak the truth to that client in that moment. Arab astrologers, okay, so now we're going forward. It's the Dark Ages in, um, in, uh, in Europe. And what happens at that time is that Europe sort of abandons these texts that they had, these beautiful Greek texts, and they're picked up by the Arabs and they're translated into Arabic. 
And you have to remember at the time, this is considered the golden age of Islam. Islam is a really new religion, and the people really, like the people who are in power, when they take on a new religion, it means that that religion is going to be a force <laughs> in that culture. And so the ruling class uh, took on uh, this new religion, and so there was a, a feeling of experimentation at that time. And uh, there was a, a spirit at that time that if you um, – look at all these old texts, you will see indications or similarities to their own revelatory text, the Quran. And so part of that did include, um, it, it included all the Greek texts and it included astrology as well. Um, even though the benefactors were Muslim, the astrologers themselves were, um, were of many different faiths. And also what was really interesting about what they did, I'll, I'll give you an example in a moment, but I will say this, that during this time, many new techniques flowered, many of which we still use today. And the Arab astrologers were instrumental in helping astrology move from a climate that was polytheistic. And then once polytheism was under attack, they helped astrology to evolve within a monotheistic paradigm. Ibn Arabi. I wrote my dissertation on him, Unity of Being, again, on my website. I always try to give him a shout-out for that because he helped me get my MA. Thank you, dude. Okay, so Ibn Arabi, I really loved his work. And what was really great about him is he was a mystic. He was a philosopher. He was an astrologer. One of his really famous works is called The Meccan Revelations, where um, he went on pilgrimage for like hundreds of days and he wrote like hundreds of chapters of all these realizations. He wrote an essay that really moved me, that really changed the way I understand um, my own life. And it, it's a small essay called, Whoso Knoweth Thyself. And what it means is, uh, the whole sentence is, Whoso Knoweth Thyself Knoweth Thy Lord. And it was this understanding that self-knowledge leads to connection with our own creator. It was Ibn Arabi who, who articulated this idea that the chart is, it, it provides us a glimpse, a clue into our fullest potential. It provides us insights into the tools that we have been blessed with so that we can fulfill whatever it is that we were created to do in this life. And so he started articulating the idea of astrology as, as a tool, as a gift. And what you also see at this time during the Arab astrologers and, and the really big dogs like him, Abu Mashar, is that this is when you start seeing astrology go from a place of being if the sun is here and the moon is here, you're going to have this at such and such an age. And it starts becoming this uh, notion of if the sun is here and the moon is here, the native might feel some conflicts, and they can resolve it by doing this. And everything, instead of necessarily being connected to a specific god, everything is beginning to be thought of as a holistic whole, as part of a psyche as a part of a single psyche, a blueprint. This is the origins of the blueprint, and he was part of that. Now, this is his work, okay? I know you can't see it, but it, I, it is pictures there, and anyone who wants a PDF of this mailed to them, I'm very happy to do that. Now, the reason I'm sharing this is because this shows you how astrology was evolving during this time. So what you have here is you have the lunar mansions, right? That's a very Indian Vedic influence. And what he's done here is he's, you know, just like in the Kabbalah and Hebrew, uh, each letter is given spiritual significance. So uh, this is true of all the ancient alphabets, including Arabic. So what he's done is each house has been given a, a different letter, um, one of the 99 names of God. And you can see here where I've highlighted the planets. And so this is, on the one hand, it's a, a mystical understanding of the cosmos, but it's also an understanding of how astrology adapts. Astrology is whatever, really, here I'm going to say something controversial. Astrology is whatever it is that we need it to be in whatever culture we are in. And so this is a representation of how astrology was evolving so that it could continue to, on the one hand, survive, but also, on the other hand, serve the people uh, who were utilizing it at the time. 
there are certain, um, and he's relating the, the planets, the houses with the planets to different prophets as well who embodied that planet. But this shows you how the, the sky stops being about this God is doing this God and they're angry with each other, but it becomes a, a holistic whole. Okay, fast forward to the Renaissance. So what happens at that time is um, the, uh, the Renaissance is slowly beginning, right? So Europe is coming out of the Dark Ages. And they take those texts that were translated into Arabic and translate them into Latin. And so this is how these texts manage to survive to this day because of the work of, of the Arab astrologers and then the Renaissance astrologers. Now, I wanted to use as an example Sacchino. Angela Voss is uh, my former professor as well. Um, I always want to give credit to these people because it's, it's not my ideas, it's really them, and I'm really grateful for uh, their contributions to our field. Um, Facino wrote um, letters in which he detailed astrology, his understanding of astrology, his interpretations. He never actually wrote a book, and his astrological writings are now really being translated more and more. Um, what is interesting about Facino is that he was a priest. And in his writings, you can see this idea of he is really trying, or you could say trying, you could say inspired to, fit astrology into a Christian context. And he's a really good example of somebody who um, found himself in an environment that was hostile to astrology on the one hand, but also on the other hand might have not really known what to do with astrology on the other. It's like, how do you deal with this? If you think about monotheism, right, in monotheism, one of the highest values of monotheism is that we have free will, is that we are co-creators, we participate in the unfolding of our lives. And because astrology, well, one of the reasons that astrology was challenged or thought uncomfortable was because astrology introduces an element of fate. And so that, uh, that was kind of contradictory to what uh, the monotheistic religions were teaching. And uh, so Facino, you can see him sort of dealing with this. You can see him sort of struggling with this. And he starts talking about things like the sun as a Christian uh, principle, as the Christ principle. Uh, you can see him talking about he had a uh, Saturn conjunctive ascendant, and I think Jupiter was there as well, close to the ascendant. And so he wrote a lot about this, and, and he wrote about how Saturn is, our, our greatest gift because it allows um, us to live the notion that faith without works is dead. And so he's one of those people who starts articulating, you've got to give your Saturn something to do. If you don't give your Saturn something to do, it's going to just, that energy is going to come in on itself. For his case, because it's the ascendant, it is depression. And so he dealt with depression throughout his life, and, and he would talk about his Saturn in these letters. He was very influential, like really he was in touch with everybody at the time, um, really helped Renaissance to evolve in the direction that it did with Greek thought. And, um, and he was a huge translator as well, so we owe him a lot. Okay, this is really important, the medieval mindset. Okay, you have to understand at this time what we had was when you walked down the street, well, maybe it was the street at the time, or the pathway, or the forest, or whatever it was, and you saw a flock of birds, that wasn't just a flock of birds, but it meant something. You were like, oh, wow, I see birds. They're going in this direction. I can feel this wind. What's going on? What, is, what message is God trying to send me? How does this speak to me? Everything was a symbol. That's the way that that people interacted with the world. And this is also, this is valuable to know because the medieval mindset is essentially what we bring to the chart to this day, what was always brought to the chart. This understanding that just like with the phenomenon that you see, it doesn't mean anything unless there's somebody there to interpret its meaning. And it's the same thing with astrology. You can't have astrology without the astrologer. 
And unless there's somebody there looking at that chart symbolically, it really doesn't mean anything. It's just a circle with some glyphs on it. We bring, we create the meaning based on who we are and what we bring to the chart. And so to take this a step further, if you are the kind of person who is very fatalistic, who thinks that there are lots of uh, forces outside of your control and that fate can be cruel, that's what you're going to see when you look at the sky. But if you're somebody like me, like all in my gift bags, I wrote the universe is wise and loving. And I say this after living through several Pluto conjunctions. <laughs> and so having lived through them, I've come to really realize that the universe is wise and loving. And that's going to influence my interpretations, that, that perspective that I bring to the chart. And then here comes Uranus. Okay. So in the books, now I'll tell you, I was here. And that green circle on the wall is literally the exact spot that William and Caroline Herschel were standing when they spotted Uranus. Yeah, it's in Bath. I love Bath. Um, I try to go there every couple of years, have been for 10 years, a little over 10 years now. And um, it's a very magical place. They discovered this whole temple to Minerva, this, this Roman temple underneath the whole city. It was a city of great healing. And to this day, they have spas and everything there. Uh, the water is said to be healing. It has natural heat uh, spring. It's a very magical place. And Uranus was discovered there as well. So at the time, of course, because Caroline was his sister and she was, uh, was William's sister and she was a woman. So it didn't matter that she was there. And William Herschel discovers uh, Uranus and became a big star in the world. Up until then, William and Caroline Herschel were musicians, local musicians in Bath. And they played around at these different little uh, spots. It, yes? Were they astronomers? Mm -hmm. They were astronomers, yes. And actually, they documented much of the sky. They're known for Uranus, but they discovered lots of different comets and cycles and different stars. So they made a huge contribution to our field. Okay, so these are the charts of discovery of Uranus. Okay. Now, I'm about to say something controversial, okay? With, uh, I think there might be one more slide, but I just want to make sure to get to it. With the discovery of Uranus, it was kind of the the official confirmation of the age of enlightenment, okay? When we hear the word enlightenment, we think of Buddhism, right? But the age of enlightenment was actually a time of scientific revolution. And it was at this time that this idea of, uh, of the physical and the spiritual became a separate thing. Now, I'll move on a little bit. There we go. Uh, this is Descartes. He actually lived a bit earlier um, than the official enlightenment, but it was really his work that was hugely influential in this. He's the guy who um, articulated this idea of flesh and spirit, body and mind. And so he's the guy who articulated this notion of a separation between the physical and between whatever we consider matters of spirit, matters of mind, matters of intellect. So, sorry? Right, but here's the thing. There are two, uh, there are two things to say. Yes, it, it was horrible and it allowed a lot of things to uh, grow from there, like uh, we can think of environmental damage, right? Once stuff is just stuff and it's no longer infused with spirit, you can do whatever you want with it. Sorry? Yes, it would have been as well, yeah. But there are, because it is Uranus, right, and, and Uranus was sort of the, the omen that signaled the time, and Uranus is the planet also of human rights. And the reason is because if you say that the physical is no longer a representation of what's happening on spiritual levels, then uh, when a person is disabled, it's no longer some representation of uh, a lesser state of spirit. And that allowed the foundation, this separation allowed the foundation for um, feminism to take root, equal rights for women, equal rights for people of color, um, rights for people with disabilities. 
So yes, there were lots of horrible things that took place at this time, but we have to acknowledge that there was also some good as well. We wouldn't have the world that we do today if it wasn't for this period of enlightenment. So Descartes, his writing, we understand it, we call it the Cartesian split, this idea of body and mind being separated now. They're no longer together. So at this point, the definition of science changed, and it was at this point that astrology ceased to be a science. Okay? I know that's controversial to some people. But this is it. So when people say that astrology is a science, I understand what perspective they're bringing and why. And there is an element of calculations, and, and that brings in the left brain. But when they say it's a science, they're operating um, on a definition that was dominant before Uranus was discovered. After that time, um, astrology became vilified. It was pushed out of universities, Western universities, and sort of had no place to go, didn't know where to go, sort of up in the air. And then along comes Neptune. Neptune, yeah? Sure. So the split between, um, so the discovery of Uranus and mm -hmm. Descartes' contribution mm -hmm. was about the split between body and matter and psyche. Yeah, it was a scientific revolution. Astrology lost its definition. It, it, astrology was no longer a science because astrology is about these two things being together. Okay. Yes, and so once once matter becomes a matter of science, right? It's the physical that's the sciences. Anything else is matters of philosophy or religion. Right. Okay. Then. And so astrology would necessarily have to find itself more in the religious realm because the origins of astrology, the development of astrology, intimately related to the development of human religion, human spirituality, human spiritual practice. And in fact, many places in the world, this is still true. In the East, this is still true. And up until very, very recently in human history, which was the discovery of Uranus, up until that point, you only practice astrology when you were either an astronomer or a priest. And the only people who were actually delivering astrology to people were the priests. Okay, so Neptune is discovered, and this launches the theosophy movement, right? Yeah, please. Neptune was discovered in 1846, and, and that's when it was officially recognized. But wasn't Neptune discovered in... Yes. So it's really interesting. What's amazing about Neptune is the existence of Neptune was predicted before it was actually physically confirmed, which I find fascinating. That's so Neptune, so Neptune. And so the thing is that a lot of people had spotted Neptune, but it hadn't officially been recognized as a planet just yet. And then along comes Newton, and he's got all these calculations under his uh, gravitational uh, theories. And he said specifically, there should be a planet right there. And it's like working with gravity. And sure enough, at the Berlin Observatory, uh, exactly where he said a planet would be, that's where we found Neptune. The launch of Neptune launched the Theosophy Movement. And the Theosophy Movement, it was very much like the 60s. Different, but like the 60s when you think about, as I was saying a little bit earlier, this idea of, um, this idea of going off to the East, bringing back some ideas, and creating these new hybrid religions and hybrid practices that blend Eastern philosophy with a Western understanding of our own agency. Yes. Yep, that is the theosophy movement, yeah. Spiritualism falls under the umbrella of the theosophy uh, movement, or at least they're connected. So it's a, uh, as I said, up until this point, astrology was like, where do I go? What do I do? And then we have Neptune, we have all these people come saying, I was in India, and I got a revelation, and I met this guru, and I'm going to show you how to make more money as a result of my awakening, like that type of thing that we still see happening today. Beyond that, mm -hmm. uh, there is more than new things that have been created in Rome that time period than any other time period in mankind. Yes. And so that's why I think it's fascinating that um, Uranus is sometimes associated with astrology, and it is um, considered a new age planet. 
But it really is Neptune that heralded the new age as we understand it, this idea of self, uh, as inner authority being the guide, this idea of cafeteria religion. I, I mean, I know some people say that is sort of a negative. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think the way we understand ourselves as human beings has changed drastically, and the Internet is evidence of that because, like with astrology, anything that's happening externally reflects what's happening um, on deeper levels, on energetic levels. And the fact that we manifested the Internet, it shows that we know ourselves to be energy, we know ourselves to be connected, and we understand that um, the physical, it, it has, well, some people understand it has its place, but more often, unfortunately, it's sort of going to this direction where um, the physical is being ab abandoned in the, in the, for preference to energy. So this heralds the New Age, and on, online you can be anybody, you can find any information, whatever inspires you in any area of life. That's very New Age. That's very New Age. We just do it with spiritual matters. Okay, Alan Leo, one of our great astrological ancestors in modern astrology. There's a great story about Alan Leo. Uh, he was uh, really around the time of like Aleister Crowley, right? So it's Europe. Um, it's this time of um, interest in all things uh, metaphysical. And Alan Leo's practicing astrology. And what is cool about Alan Leo is, you know, today, like when we, um, when we go, like right in here, you can go into the trade room and you can pay money and get a reading, a computer-generated reading, right, $10. And it, it says to you, Aries, uh, Venus in Aries, paragraph. Venus in sixth house paragraph, right? So there isn't the synthesis of an astrologer, but there, there is this breakdown and ways in which you can get that, uh, that actual paper that tells you about yourself. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, it was getting one of those computer-generated uh, charts that blew my mind. That made me say, wow, I've got to learn how to read charts. This is awesome. I can't believe it's me in paper. And so it has its value. But this is what Alan Leo did. He advertised in women's magazines. And he said, you know, write here and send money and, uh, and we'll send you a, a reading. And really, like, the, the orders would come in and one of his assistants would go, would calculate the chart and would say, okay, Venus, Capricorn, and take out that sheet. Venus, sixth house, and take out that sheet, and would put together this um, package and mail it back to people. And this was the origins of the computer-generated chart and reading. Yeah. So uh, Alan Leo was arrested on charges of fortune telling, and he stood in a um, in a courtroom in England, and he had to emphasize the separation between tendencies and prediction because prediction was illegal and so if astrology was going to survive it had to become more of a tool it had to become something that showed you what maybe your tendencies are give you some suggestions on how to improve your life that was the argument that was made at this time that astrology can, can be used as a tool to maximize your own potential and um, one thing that he wrote was really interesting. If you guys haven't read uh, Esoteric Astrology, that's one of his big seminal works, I would recommend that. And the other thing I want to say is that a lot of times, um, I know I've done this many, many times, is that when, I, um, when I'm doing some, uh, like I, I buy a new book and I'm very excited about it, and when I think about, okay, yeah, I have Venus in such and such house, I will literally just go to the middle of the book and be like, okay, look it up. Let me see. But the thing is, is that you learn a lot if you read the introduction. Because the introductions to books really tell you what philosophical orientation this person is bringing to their interpretation. And I'm of the belief that if you understand the philosophical interpretation, the philosophical stance, everything else makes a lot more sense. And that's why when I teach students, I say to them, like, I was teaching with ATI a class on aspects. It was great. What, I love that organization, Astrology Toronto. And I was saying to them, like, look, just get the basics down. If you understand what a trine is, when you see a grand trine, it makes sense. And when you see a chart pattern that's got all kinds of trines in it, it makes sense. You get it. 
get the very basics down. Understand why it's a trine, why the ancients understood it that way. What is it that's perfect about it? Why is it considered part of a triangle? If you get that and you understand that philosophically, it, it all makes a lot more sense. And also that way you can find your own ways in which um, deities are meant to inspire you. Because I'm really of the belief that when you're an astrologer, it's very rare for people to um, stick with one strict system of astrology or one strict school. It's very rare. Some people do, and that's awesome. They allow that tradition to continue. But most of us, what we do in the West is that we go to different events like these, read a lot of different books, we read different perspectives, and then we test them out on our own chart. And then if it works for us, if it resonates for us, then we go about and try it on other people. I try it on our family, on our friends. And if it works on that level, then we'll start to try it on our clients. Because the clients who come to us, they're coming for what we have to offer. And before we can give them what we think is going to help them, we have to ensure that it helps us. And so archetypes will remain, right? Venus has always been associated with love across centuries, across time and history. But how Venus is interpreted and utilized it has, been, uh, has ranged the spectrum. Now with Alan Leo, the thing that he said that was really awesome was he talked about the consciousness that you bring to a chart. The higher your consciousness, the different that chart is going to manifest itself. And so somebody who maybe doesn't have a lot of, um, who isn't bringing, this is according to Alan Leo, someone who, who isn't as conscious, right? they're going to experience their chart and their planets in terms of houses, in terms of things happening in that area of life, correlating to the planet and how it's positioned and how it's aspected, that, that is in there, the sign. But someone who's bringing a higher level of evolution is going to move beyond houses and go towards aspects. So what that means is, the core energies of the planets and how they are speaking with each other becomes more dominant, is more important when you have a higher level of consciousness. And then that way you can actually address the energy and it doesn't have to manifest in the physical through the houses because you've resolved any issues that there are on energetic levels. And then if you're really bringing a high level of consciousness, then the planets become core energies as part of your soul and you know how to work with those core energies. You understand that when you're feeling love, okay, this is Venus speaking through you. And then that way, again, it doesn't have to manifest with all this tension playing out in different parts of your chart, but you're connected to that energy and you can access it and manifest it as you desire. Is that from esoteric astrology? Exactly, exactly. He wrote quite a few books. I wonder if any would be free at this point, possibly online. There's a great website. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. I, I think it's called sacredtext.org, something to that effect. And they have all this stuff online. I would really encourage it. Esoteric astrology, that's really his, him and Alice Bailey really put that together. Okay, so along comes Jung, Carl Jung. A lot of us know Carl Jung from a very famous quote, right? Like he has this quote that is, I'm paraphrasing here, that says, um, whatever happens in a moment of time carries the characteristic of that time, right? So that's a, a seed argument, that everything has an origin and it has a seed and that forever influences or speaks to whatever that thing becomes, that entity, that person. Later on in his life, it was replaced with the theory of synchronicity, Okay, so later on in his life, he sort of evolved this theory, and he said, you know what, maybe not. Because he started taking into account what he called the alchemical process, and this idea of transformation. And he replaced his theory of the moment of time with the theory of synchronicity. And synchronicity means meaningful chance. It's when participation and observation sort of come together and you receive an omen that means something to you in that moment. And so just like with a reading, like an astrology reading, when that person comes in front of you, look, I, I know for me, I've been staring at my chart for a good almost 20 years now, I still see new stuff in there. I still see things like, oh, wow, wow, look at that. 
when we see a client, we see them, what, for an hour, 90 minutes, right? We might, if, if they're regular, we might see them, you know, maybe once or twice a year. I don't know. It depends on the person. Or we'll likely, I don't know, for me, I see that client once pretty much. Because I'm very big picture, I tend to, like, go years forward in advance. I really like using the outer planets. That's my personal preference. But anyways, in that moment, you are there to deliver whatever it is that's going to resonate with this, that person. And this goes back to the idea of real life versus speculative reading. Astrology's biggest stars are right here. Nadia Shaw Productions, new episodes every Thursday.